Hello everyone, it's Josh Melbourne here. I'm recording this short note to let you know the very sad news that Siobhan O'Sullivan, who founded Knowing Animals in 2015, has died. She was 49. As many of you will know, Siobhan was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2020. This was when I took over the podcast, first temporarily, but then more permanently. I'm sure there'll be some listeners who knew Siobhan better than I did. After all, we lived on opposite sides of the planet. But I hope you'll forgive me for sharing a few personal thoughts about Siobhan in this introduction. Siobhan was an advocate for animals and a great believer in the power of academic work to do good for animals. She was also an advocate for the discipline of animal studies and for early career scholars and scholars from minority backgrounds who wanted to pursue animal studies. Knowing animals, of course, was one of the important venues through which she undertook this academic advocacy. But Siobhan's own research was also hugely important, and I'm sure its ripples will be felt for years to come. In particular, she was a leading advocate of what has been called the political turn in animal ethics. That is, the emergence of work in political philosophy, political theory and political science that takes animal ethics very, very seriously. Her 2011 book, Animals, Equality and Democracy, was a groundbreaking early work in this area. And she co-edited the 2016 collection, The Political Turn in Animal Ethics, which was a real watershed publication for the subdiscipline. I'm very proud to think of my own work as firmly in the tradition that Siobhan helped to establish and shape, and I dedicated my 2023 book, Food, Justice and Animals, Feeding the World Respectfully, to Siobhan. Knowing Animals will continue, and I'm currently involved in conversations about expanding the hosting team to ensure the podcast's longevity and continued relevance. But today I'm re-releasing an episode in which Siobhan was interviewed by Claire McCausland about her work on being an animal studies scholar. This episode was originally recorded in 2019 and released as episode 138 of Knowing Animals. This episode, I think, addresses a topic that will be of interest to many of our listeners and, unsurprisingly, it's ended up being one of our most listened to episodes. So I hope you'll all join me in listening back to this interview and using it to reflect on how far animal studies as a discipline has come and what potential it has for the future. If I may speak on behalf of the Knowing Animals community, including hosts, guests and listeners, we'll miss you, Siobhan. This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. (coughs) Dr Siobhan O'Sullivan (coughs) does like knowing animals. (coughs) Dr Siobhan O'Sullivan (coughs) Does like knowing animals. Hi, people. Welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. My name's Claire McCausland, and I also like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by AASA. That's the Australasian Animal Studies Association. It does fantastic work to support, coordinate, drive, inspire, and all sorts of things for animal studies scholars right across the region. This episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public Books Series. It's a part of the University of Sydney Press, or Sydney University Press, and there's heaps of really wonderful books that you can see on their website. Crosses all sorts of boundaries, fiction, non-fiction, and all kinds of animals that they write about. So have a look. But wait on, who am I? Who's Claire? Where's Siobhan O'Sullivan? Well, this is a very special episode because today the tables are being turned. Today we are going to speak to Dr Siobhan O'Sullivan about her work and turn the screws on her and ask her to share us her insights about the research that she's been doing. Welcome Siobhan. Hi Claire, thanks so much for having me. So Siobhan is a Senior Lecturer in Social Policy at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And today we're going to discuss her recent article, Tainted Love, The Trials and Tribulations of a Career in Animal Studies, relevant to lots and lots of people who listen to this podcast, I'm sure. The article was published in the journal Society and Animals in 2019, and we should definitely give a shout out to Siobhan's co-authors Yvette Watt and Fiona proben Rapsi. Hello, Yvette. Hi, Fiona. (laughs) Hello, ladies. So, Siobhan, can you start by telling us what inspired you to do or to lead your work? Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, 
So it all started a few years ago now, actually quite a few years ago as tends to happen with academic work unfortunately. We were at a mining animals conference in India and there was something said in one of the sessions that got Fiona proben Rapsi thinking about the issue of how do we define animal studies and I had known Fiona and also Yvette Watt for quite a long time, particularly Yvette, she and I have a long history together, but we never worked together and I think Fiona thought it could be nice if we could collaborate in some way and so she approached us both and said, why don't we do a survey of animal studies and see what people think the field is about. So that was kind of the genesis of the idea. We then developed a survey which was about 40 words, uh, beg your pardon, 40 questions in the survey, p- primarily closed questions but a few open questions which are relevant to the paper we're discussing today. And so the open questions were things like what's been the best thing about being an animal studies scholar, what's been the most challenging thing, etc. And so we, um, we distributed the survey internationally, called on a lot of friends and networks around the world to, to push the survey out. We got a really nice response rate, almost 500 animal studies scholars. And then what we did is that the three of us, we had an understanding between us that we would each drive an article. So we'd each be the first named author on an article that was, I guess, um, tuning into an issue that we find particularly interesting or engaging. So the first thing we did when we got the data is we all got together and it's quite an undertaking because we all live in different parts of Australia. So we often get together at Yvette's place in Hobart, in Tasmania. and We went through the data, all agreed on what we thought we saw in there and then went away and decided on what we would like our article to be focused on. And so in my case, what I saw in the data, which I found really intriguing, was a lot of people saying that being an animal studies scholar is hard or um, miserable or um, demoralising or humiliating or jeopardising their career in some way. And so to me that, that immediately suggests a puzzle, which is, you know, presumably these are people that want to be academics um, and yet they're deciding or agreeing to study or research in a field where they feel that it is perhaps um, going to make it harder to have an academic career. And so then the question becomes why? Why would you do that? That seems to be an irrational thing to do. And so that was the um, focus that I decided to take. I mean, just between Fiona, Yvette and I, we tend to think of it as my article, Fiona's article, Yvette's article. We are all co-authors on all of them, but the one that I took the lead on and conceptualised and drove um, had that focus And then, um, you know, we were going through, we had one of these writing weekends in Hobart and we're going through the literature on animal studies scholarship and what it's like being an animal studies scholar. And one of the pivotal uh, articles talked about animal studies as a tainted field. And we just started uh, spontaneously singing the song Tainted Love. And we kept, you know, coming back to that song throughout the weekend. And then I thought, oh, I really want to get that into the article And so um, that's why it's ended up being called Tainted Love. And I think a lot of the lyrics from the song do actually speak to this love-hate relationship with the field and academia, et cetera. So that's that's how it all unfolded. Fantastic. And I love the use of the lyrics all the way throughout the article. I thought that was lovely and I had the song in my head for weeks afterwards. So the article's about trials and tribulations and these challenges and how people find it very difficult, but I thought it ended on a pretty positive note. Do you think it is worth it after all? Is is a career in animal studies worth all of the challenges? Do you know, it's really interesting, Claire. That's a very profound question. I think, um, and I guess it's interesting, uh, regular listeners of the show will know that when a guest comes on the show for the second time, which is the category I'm falling into now because you've interviewed me previously, they're asked four quick questions at the end and astute listeners will detect that the four quick questions, at least in part, are taken from questions that I thought were interesting in the survey. So in a sense, I'm kind of going to start to answer the four quick questions anyway (laughs) by, (laughs) by giving this response. But is it worth it? it? It is a really interesting question and I think that's why, I mean, in a way we did have to end on a positive note because people do do it. So so there is, in a sense it is irrational, but in a sense it is the lived experience of a lot of people. 
One of the things I will say is that I did, I had to make a very difficult decision when I was going to write my PhD as to whether I focus on animals or something else. And I knew at PhD stage that I was hoping to pursue a career in academia and I was advised not to do animals. And the reason was employability post-PhD. So in the end, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do animals. It's what I'm interested in. It's what I know. And so I made that decision, which was a very difficult decision. But one of the things that became apparent to me on my PhD journey was that I had a topic of research that I cared about. I was really interested in it. I never lost my interest in it. Other people who, you know, I'm a political scientist, other people who might be looking at, you know, the Senate or voting irregularity or why public servants, you know, find it hard to redesign programs or whatever. I think they on that journey in Australia, it's typically around four years. That journey, they found it long and tiring. And even some of them, for example, never did anything with their with their thesis. Whereas I always maintained interest and pride in my work and I was happy to, to rewrite my thesis as a monograph and I still, you know, think about those issues and my research on animals continues to speak to those same key fundamental issues. So is it worth it in terms of having an interesting, engaging, passionate, kind of real experience? I think yes. And that's what we try to get to at the end of the article. You, it doesn't challenge your authenticity. You're not, you're not just going through the motions. You're living something very real. So in that sense, it is positive, but there are plenty of disheartening things about doing animal studies. Well, we don't want to discourage <laughs> the younger listeners of your podcast from you know, undertaking this important work. Mm. But can I just come back to your experience as well? Because you do maintain an active stream of research in other areas of political science. Do you think that your career would be jeopardised if you didn't have that other body of work that you focus on? Um, I, so what happened in my case was that as uh, once I'd submitted my PhD, I started looking for work and there was no, no work on animal stuff. You know, uh, at, at that time, certainly completely unthinkable. Um, but I used a lot of very complicated methods in my thesis. And so I was employed on the basis of my methods and my employers took the view that my case, which had been animals could become a different case in this case welfare to work and I would just and that, so they wanted my methods basically now what happened for me at that moment I wanted a job I was very pleased to get a job and I thought right great the, I mean it was a very ter- I mean my first contract was seven months or something like that so it's not a glorious job but I was happy to get any kind of job but what happened in my case is that I really fell in love with that field of research as well and so I then became very immersed in this world of welfare to work and policy making and new public management and kept my interest in animals on the side. So for me, it was, there was nothing forced or, or in a, inorganic about it. What I do question is what might have happened to me had it not just been absolute dumb luck that this job that I just saw in the paper that I applied for and received happened to be something that ended up being really interested in. Could it be that I'm susceptible to being interested in anything put in front of me? <clears throat> Perhaps not. No, we're getting a <laughs> shaking of the head from Claire. Um, but this welfare to work, it taps into a lot of things about human vulnerability and fairness and equity and the welfare state and how we protect the vulnerable and how we make policy for the vulnerable. So it actually isn't that big a stretch from from animal-related issues yeah, and right. justice, etc. So I have found this second little home. And it's this second little home that has allowed me to do things such as receive funding grants. So in animal studies, in my experience, it's still very, very hard to receive funding to do animal-related research. You can do your own little boutique non-funded research, but to get a lot of of funding, it, it still remains very hard. So I feel as I've landed in this ideal situation where I can do this welfare to work research which is terribly popular, well funded, well regarded, a lot of people are interested in it and I can also do this boutique um, animal studies uh, research that I'm deeply committed to and have been for a long time and so the only downside to that kind of way of doing things is that my 
publications are very split. So for the animal studies people, it might seem as though I'm doing half the volume of work I am and same for welfare yeah. work. But then who cares? <laughs> So back to the challenges that came out, because securing funding was one of the challenges that people raised. What were some of the other challenges that people spoke about in your research? And do you think that they're inherent to animal studies or do you think that other disciplines find them too? What, what is it about animal studies that makes it so unique um, that other newly emerging or unloved disciplines um, don't also experience? Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. It's kind of a... Um, that points to, I think, perhaps the central crux of the issue, which I think maybe comes out in the paper, which is on the one hand, to speak of animals is to enter into a world of emotion, sentimentality. Um, we Another paper in this series that was um, spearheaded by Fiona Probe and Ratsy is called Pussy Panic. And we draw on this notion that if you go into animal studies, not only are you compromising yourself intellectually because you're daring to think about animals, but you're doing it in the company of women. And we all know that women can't be trusted with ideas. So this, um, so at the one, on the one hand, it's this huge risk, animals, particularly in politics, to try and to stand up and say to people, you know, when I went to apply to do my PhD, I was told that we can't, we don't do animals in the politics department. If you want to do animals, you've got to go to philosophy. Now, I was lucky. I had a really great supervisor who backed me and I did get into the program doing animals. But that wasn't so long ago. We don't do animals in politics. So, it, there's something about the animal that stands out. But in terms of emerging subfields, I think animal studies scholars have done something really remarkable. And I think the reason they have done it have generated what you might say is a new emerging substantive subfield. People have can do a PhDs in animal studies. There are named positions in animal studies. There are centres. There are minors. There are degrees. Is because it also engenders passion. And so we're talking about people who are prepared to push through and prepared to really fight for. So you know, um, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. You know that, in a sense, that organisation's a triumph. It, it started from nothing, and it's it's lasted all these years, and it's had conferences every two years, um, come what may, all on this, all on the smell of an oily rag, because people care. I think that's absolutely true. I think the passion and I think the motivation to do well and to have an impact in the world is indisputable in animal studies. Um, one of the things that really struck me was a remark that you made in the paper about moral motivation and whether or not this would lead to the idea that it might that it ought to prevent the infighting that people's remarked on and I thought would it prevent infighting or would it in fact promote infighting so I'm interested in exploring this um, because it maybe it's unique to animal studies that people do you know critique each other with more passion than you might see in organic chemistry, for instance. Um, maybe you can talk more about that. Yeah, look, I'm actually really interested in your view about that, Claire. I should have asked you before we, we started the interview. I mean, to me, I was surprised at that finding. So for people who haven't read the, the article, um, you know, we said what's the most disheartening thing about being an animal studies scholar and lots of people said having to work with an other animal studies scholars <laughs> and it was really disheartening I had to go through and manually code the all the open questions and it was quite confronting yeah. but it was also one of the best things that people found quite that's a, right quite a contradiction that's <laughs> right and then the, then I went to code the the other question what's the best thing and again I'm working with wonderful clever <laughs> colleagues compassionate colleagues so I myself don't feel that I can there's certainly the odd person who I actively dislike but <laughs> overall I love my animal studies colleagues I think they're wonderful um I don't have any sense in which being overly critical of them is going to help animals or help anyone so I find I feel as though I work in an extremely kind supportive um, you know, research community. I had sabbatical last year and I um, was 
based at the University of Sheffield and, you know, my colleagues there. You know, I think of all these other animal study scholars around the world as my colleagues and they, you know, helped facilitate me being there and then other people invited me to other universities and it was so lovely and I can tell you my welfare to work colleagues aren't doing the same. Yeah, right. So th- I do find it really loving and close and because we're a small community, we all know each other and we want to see each other succeed. Um, but it could be that I'm – it could be that s- – could say something about my particular personality. It, it could be that I'm just blind to it. Maybe people just like you a lot. Um, perhaps <laughs> it's just my wonderful personality, indeed. I'm sure but that's that, it. But that said, I've not noticed in the welfare to work uh, <laughs> <laughs> so much. I wondered whether there was a comparison to make with animal activism. And I know that you've done some marvellous research on civil disobedience and animal activism. I can't remember who your co-author is, but I remember that she was very striking. Um, but I wondered whether we talk about infighting in animal activist circles as well. And maybe we can think about animal studies as a kind or a branch of animal activism. And some of what we see there with that passion leading to strong and heated disagreements about the best way to support animals has carried over into some parts of the discipline. I'm not sure. I tend to agree with your experience um, it seems like a pretty supportive environment to me I don't know whether that resonates at all or look it certainly does there's no doubt that there is infighting in the animal protection movement no doubt at all and I can remember the name of my co-author on that paper I think it was Clem McCausland she's (laughs) she's from La Trobe Um, but I you know it's uh, I've got another hypothesis tell us I think that perhaps the people who felt really angry and expressed that in the article were perhaps people who aren't vegan. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a tension with animal studies, and this goes to the paper that Yvette took the lead on, um, which is should we eat our research subjects? So you might be able to guess what it's about. Um, I think there is a tension between the vegans, the vegetarians and the meat eaters, which is as yet unresolved. And as a vegan, I perhaps am in the situation where I can walk around thinking, oh, everyone wow. agrees, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if I was a um, a meat eater, I might feel a bit judged or under... Yep. So that might also be part of it. I think that's a good insight. That strikes me as very, very plausible. We really should learn more and share with your listeners the details of Fiona's at Yvette's articles as well too. And I must go out and have a read of them. Yes. Well, Fiona's been on the on the podcast, interviewed. Her her interview, which was about three months ago, is Pussy Panic. And Yvette's not been interviewed yet about her article, although she has been on the show a couple of times. Fantastic. Finally, um, we're in Australia and our government loves talking about research impact. It's very important for Australian scholars and for our chances at securing funding and I was really surprised that only nine percent of the people who responded to your survey were concerned that their research wasn't having any impact. Lots of confidence there. Should they be worried? <laughs> I, my first, when I read that the first time I was thinking less about research impact from a government perspective and more about but is animal studies really helping the animals? Are we really supporting them or are we writing articles for our colleagues to read? And then I started thinking about research impact and about the comment that you made at the end of the article saying, well, humanities and social sciences struggles um, with this feature. Do you think that that degree of confidence people had is warranted or is that something that we should be paying attention to? Or are we in fact making all the impact in the world and we're, you know, clear sailing? Yeah, it is really interesting about impact and this is something that I've been reflecting on for the last few years in a range of different ways. You know, I've been vegan for many decades and I wonder if that was to any benefit to anyone. I was actively involved in the animal protection movement and again I wonder, you know, what the... I I wonder what the animals... if, If we could ask the animals if they know what we're doing, if it's had any impact on their lives, I really wonder if any of it would register. Veganism's right up. Chicken, what do you think about that? No, you know, their lives are the same. Animal studies. So I feel, so at times I do feel a bit kind of despairing about the actual real world impact for animals. But then I think, well, what's the alternative? Do nothing? That's definitely not going to have an impact. That's not right, yeah. Um, 
In terms of the kind of the KPIs at the university, and our article talks a lot about the neoliberal higher education sector, something that I know you're very familiar with. I don't know how sophisticated we are just yet as and I think we're really just trying to find our feet and do as best we can and one of the things that we say in the article is that most people really have to be in another field as well so they, okay. they they're not a primarily an animal studies scholar they're primarily a literature scholar or a film studies or a gender or philosopher and so when they make a decision about what research topic they look at, they will um, do animals. And then, of course, a lot of these disciplines are under threat as a general proposition just because of the neoliberal agenda. So humanities, arts, etc. cetera, not, you know, you wouldn't say on the face of it at the moment that they're thriving. So then I think one of the things we say is, well perhaps given the need to show these outputs and outcomes and all the rest of it, maybe animal studies does have a little bit of an advantage over, you know, Romanian, Romanian folk poultry because there, there are active debates about Absolutely. the status of animals in this world and it's becoming more of a mainstream issue, etc. So perhaps that's the answer. That's good. That's a positive answer. Oh, good. <laughs> so let's seamlessly transition into four quick questions which speak directly to the research oh, no. that you're doing. They're such mean questions. I can't believe we've been trying to force other people to answer these <laughs> impossible questions. Well, let me say that all guests who come onto the podcast <laughs> answer quick questions and you are no exception. And as you are a return guest, you have only four to answer. So are you ready for your four, for your four questions? I'm ready. So <laughs> to the topic of your research, what's been the most satisfying or rewarding aspects of conducting animal studies research? So I think for me, and this harks back to what we've already discussed, I think it has been really nice doing research that I find sincerely interesting and meaningful um, I don't think I would have been able to sustain research just going through the motions. And a lot of, as a lot of people know, as you know, as a lot of listeners know, in the, you know, in the current higher education environment, often our research is unfortunately what we do on the weekends, what we do at night, where we push through quite a few, you know, pain barriers. We make sacrifices. We don't go to things. We don't, you know, go shopping or whatever else. We do our research. And because I care and am interested, I think that has been an advantage to me to, to push through and to get it done and to, to get it out there. So that has been really rewarding. I have to say, I feel like I've got a lot of really lovely colleagues, really nice colleagues for animal studies as I say, the odd person I don't like, but overall I really <laughs> like most people. Um, and it's been satisfying to see it grow. It is. What's the most challenging or disheartening aspect of conducting animal studies research? Well, for me, uh, really, I think I have... Sp so I've spent my career primarily in what in Australia we call group of eight universities. So they're like the top eight elite universities particularly the old sandstones, I found them very hostile to animal studies. So I find it disappointing. I find the university so behind in being willing to consider animals as a legitimate research topic. I'm currently at, a, uh, at UNSW, which is a group of eight university, but it's a newer one. And I found the attitude there refreshing, much more open-minded to animal issues. But Funding is still very, very difficult to obtain. The gatekeepers are very old-fashioned in their perspectives and I have found that very disheartening. So I think we've still got quite a journey to go on before it really is not just some weirdo side project but a real legitimate mainstream activity. Well, let's hope we see some generational change in that aspect too. Now, can you think of an animal studies scholar that you would like to make listeners aware of? It could be an emerging scholar, someone who's written in the field but who's not received the recognition that you think they deserve, someone who publishes in a language other than English or someone who isn't an animal studies scholar or such but who undertakes interesting, relevant research. Having promoted dozens and dozens and dozens of such people on your podcast, is there someone amongst that group or perhaps someone else who you'd like to give a particular shout-out to today? 
So, Claire, I have really agonised over this question. I didn't do a lot of work sitting down and reading the paper really carefully once again. I didn't really spend a lot of time on the other questions, but in my head, I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be asked who to give a shout out to. And I really did try to think, who could I, if I had to just choose one, how could I do it? And and all these different lovely, beautiful people came through my head, but one is such a difficult one. So in the end, what I feel I have to do is give a shout out to political scientists. I feel that oh. I'm part of a little community of political scientists. There's been such hostility to animal studies in that field. And particularly my colleagues in the UK are really starting to get a bit of a groove on and I feel I need to support that effort. So at the University of Sheffield and in, you also at the University of Leicester, they've got these little animal studies groups emerging that have political uh, scientists in there. And I'd like to give a shout out to Josh Milbourne. Not that he needs me to do it. He's very, very accomplished and he's only one among many, but he's emblematic of someone who is thinking about political questions from a very animal studies perspective. He's really putting the animal front and centre of political philosophical questions. And I'd like to encourage him, not that he needs my encouragement, and others like him to really keep doing that political work. Fantastic. I know that was a hard decision for you. It was hard. It was hard, Claire. Obviously a very worthy worthy, uh, choice. Thank you. Finally, are you optimistic about the future of human and non-human animal relations? Oh, Claire, this this is so difficult. I, I recently did a talk at UNSW where the topic was what will the world look like in 70 years? That was just a topic they threw out to everyone in the entire university, um, big ideas at UNSW. And I thought, I'm going to have a think about what the world might look like for non-human animals in 70 years' time. Mm-hmm. And it was very confronting doing the research. Do you know that we have there are three times more agricultural animals alive than humans at the moment? I believe that. It's terrible. So and under those conditions, how can we be optimistic? So I guess if, when I think about wildlife, I think there are species that are being lost continually. Australia, we have a terrible um, record on extinction. And so once that species goes extinct, they're extinct. So I think for a lot of species, the answer is no, it's grim and it's not going to get better. Perhaps some species, um, definitely some species will survive through these dark days and maybe have a chance to flourish in the future when we get better as humans. <clears throat> and then when I think about animal agriculture and other animal uses that we, you know, the ways we use animals commercially, we could stop the suffering, but I just don't know that I see the signs. Even this latest wave of veganism, I think, could easily be... A, I don't know that it necessarily translates into less animals harmed, But also, you know, as more and more of the developing world emulates the terrible things we've been doing in the in the um, in the West, more and more animals are going to suffer. So, I don't think it's a good time to be a non-human animal. I wish we could get better, but I fear that we're not very good at caring about others. Oh, we've seen a side of you today that people might not have been familiar with. Mm. But let's see if we can turn the conversation around a little bit. Tell us what you're working on next. Oh, okay. Thank you, Claire. So um, I want to let listeners know that I'm making some changes to the Knowing Animals podcast. I started doing it in 2015 as a kind of an infrequent podcast. And then in 2016 and 2017, I started doing it fortnightly. In 2018 and 2019, I decided to go weekly and I did it weekly for two years. So that is 52 episodes a year. Anyway, it turns out that's really exhausting. (laughs) 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 Trying to do a full-time academic job plus manage all the other aspects of my life plus put out basically a free radio program once a week that's dependent on other people agreeing to come on and showing up and blah, 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 blah. Too much. So... This year, I'm going to go back to fortnightly. Fortnightly is manageable. My fear is that if I, I... I would love to bring an episode to everyone weekly, but my fear is that if I tried it, I would crash and burn and the show would be ended. So it might be a little bit of shock to loyal listeners who are used to 
every Monday at midday, Sydney, Melbourne time, getting a new episode of um, Knowing Animals. It's going to be every second week. But I'm hoping to keep it going in that way. Um, in terms of my publishing, uh, we're going to run the Animal Study Survey again this year, so in 2020. So I'd love people to fill it out and we can see how the field has changed. Um, in my heart, one of my big um, important projects that matters to me and has mattered to me for a long time and I th- will matter to me into the foreseeable future is the social contribution that animal activists have made and you and I have written about that a lot and I continue to think about that and want to explore that more in, in whatever ways I can. Um, so that's just some of the things that I am doing uh, in the future. I'm so glad to hear about all three of those things. Can your listeners access the survey when so, it comes out? Yes. So when the survey comes out, I would absolutely love listeners to fill it out. Absolutely love it. So what it will be, it will be a link. Mm-hmm. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make it available in whatever means we can. We'll post it to Facebook groups. We'll send it out via emails. We'll ask I, – I, I hopefully what I can do also, I'll put a link on the Knowing Animals Facebook page through the Twitter feed. I might also put a link on the um, – on the um, descriptions for the episodes at the time it's live. So I'm really going to try my best to make it very available. And if people could take the time to fill it out, it's not a long survey. I'd say it takes 10 minutes, maybe 15, if you really agonise over the answers. I would love us to track this field. And I see this survey as part of the maturing of the field. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'd love people to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the podcast, I think giving everybody else a chance to catch up with the episodes that they haven't <laughs> listened to, now that they're fortnightly on those alternate weeks, you can go back into the archive and find all those people that you just haven't had a chance to oh, good. download the episode yeah, for. Yeah, good thinking, So Claire. I think this is a good opportunity. Everybody, you know where to find them. Yes, yes. Fantastic. So... Thank you, Siobhan, for joining us today on Knowing Animals, where we talk to an animal studies scholar about their work. Don't forget to follow Twitter knowing, at Knowing Animals or on Facebook at Knowing Animals. And don't forget to tell others about us and to review the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for others to find us. I'm Claire McCausland and I also do like Knowing Animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. com.